Like an orchestra or a choir of beautifully arranged music, Scripture is a symphony of truth. It rings together, moves together with all of its different parts to sing one melodious harmony that results in the product, the glorification, the revelation, and the exaltation of Jesus Christ. From the Old Testament to the New Testament. The prophet Zechariah wrote in the 6th century B.C., right around 516 B.C. The temple had been destroyed. They were looking to rebuild it even as people were regathering from being dispersed. The focus of Zechariah was on the messianic hope that there is a Messiah coming and that this Messiah is going to make everything new. So there was a call to repentance, but also of purification. And in Zechariah chapter 14, verse 20 to 21, speaking of that day of the Lord coming, it speaks of the purification of the temple. Zechariah chapter 14, verse 20. And on that day there shall be inscribed on the bells of the horses, Holy to the Lord. And the pots in the house of the Lord shall be as the bowls before the altar. And every pot in Jerusalem and Judea shall be holy to the Lord of hosts, so that all who sacrifice may come and take of them and boil the meat of sacrifice in them. And there shall no longer be a traitor trader in the house of the Lord of hosts on that day. So on that day, there will be purification. Everybody will say holy to the Lord. And on that day, that even in the house of the Lord, there shall no longer be commerce or a trader in the house of the Lord of hosts on that day as this messenger, this person comes and purifies the house of the Lord. This is a sign of the Messiah. Please turn with me to the prophet Malachi. Last book in the Old Testament, the prophet Malachi writing shortly after Zechariah, and he writes about two messengers, one messenger who is going to prepare the way, and then one messenger who is going to inaugurate a new era as the Messiah. In Malachi chapter 3, verse 1 to 4, Malachi writes this, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. And the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming and who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. He will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver. And they will bring offerings in righteousness to the Lord. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord as in the days of old, as in the former years. Malachi writes in chapter 3 that a messenger is going to come and prepare the way. And then there's going to be a second messenger after the Lord comes suddenly into the temple. Now the Lord comes suddenly to the temple. This is Yahweh suddenly without expectation or without the people understanding fully or knowing will come suddenly to his temple. And the second messenger is going to be a messenger of the covenant. Now the question we may ask and say, okay, who is this second messenger? The first one is a forerunner, but who is the second one? The second one must also be identified as Yahweh God himself. Why? Because we see that in verse 2, 3, 4. That he is the one who is the Lord of hosts. The one who is of the day of the Lord's coming. These are ancient books. Written some 600 years before the time of Christ. No matter who you are, where you're from, we're glad you're here. We're a church of broken people all in need of God's grace. And you may be hearing about these ancient books and saying, yeah, but that's just mythology. Maybe you're curious about Christianity or maybe you're skeptical. But I can tell you that what we are reading here is not just mythology. Matter of fact, it's history, accurate history. These are events that real happened, and these are people that wrote about circumstances that we can document. I can take you to places in Israel or Turkey or in Greece and show you the archaeology. I've been there, seeing some of these places and tell you that these are real events, real places in time and space. And in that time and space, 600 years before the time of Christ, 2,600 years from our time, they spoke about this day when someone would come into the temple, purify it, a day of the Lord that would inaugurate 
a new era. This is the expectation of the prophets, that Yahweh will purify the temple. Now, John 1, we've been reading through John 1. We're studying through it. John 1 says that the messenger, the first messenger who's going to prepare the way is John the Baptist. But who is the second messenger? The messenger of the covenant, the one who will come suddenly into the temple, who will expel the traders that will purify the sons of Levi, purify the priesthood. Please turn with me to John chapter 2. I invite you to turn to John chapter 2, beginning in verse 13. Now we're studying through the gospel of John. And I know that even as we study through the gospel of John, there are many things happening in our world around us. A lot of saber rattling of the nations. I know that for many of us, the elections are on our minds and thoughts, even as we hear the news cycles roar about us. Next week, on uh, next Sunday, I'm going to take a few moments and just give some perspective, hopefully going into election day. This week, Pastor Mike and I are going to do a podcast. Uh, we do a podcast on the weekly called Focus on Christ. You can see that at focusonchrist.com. Go to the YouTube channel, Focus on Christ. Go to our website, hbclinchburg.com here. And you can see as we talk weekly about different things. Now, this week, we're going to take a special episode and talk about uh, just perspectives as a Christian on the election. How do we wrestle through questions like, how does a Christian vote? Does a Christian vote? How should the Christian view the government? What is our responsibility there? So I hope that as we go into this season of history in our nation, that that can helpfully be some guidance from you from God's word with some things to think about. Now with that in mind, as important as it is to think about the nations and the kingdoms of men, to be frank, I am less inclined and interested in speaking about kingdoms of men when we can talk about the kingdom of God that is coming. So in that light, let's talk about the kingdom of Christ. And let's talk about who he is and how he shows himself in this passage. Beginning in verse 13. The Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and the money changers sitting there. And making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told those who sold the pigeons, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. So the Jews said to him, what sign do you show us for doing these things? Jesus answered them. Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, It has taken 46 years to build the temple, and you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his body. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. Verse 23, Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing. But Jesus on his part did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people and needed no one to bear witness about man for he himself knew what was in man. Overview of this passage. I hope that it's explicit and we can make a clear connection between what is going on here and what Zechariah and Malachi foresaw. One who will suddenly come into the temple, who will purify the temple, who will demonstrate a new era, a new messianic age. Remember the Gospel of John, John himself, as an eyewitness, though there's many things he could say, many things he could write, he is writing to draw out significant theological points that will demonstrate in accordance with his thesis in John chapter 20, that these things are written so that you may believe, that you might know who this Jesus is. So he brings out some different signs, signs that portray and demonstrate who this Christ is, the sign of at Cana in Galilee when he turns the water into wine. And now we come to his second sign as he cleanses the temple. He comes at Passover, one of the holiest celebrations of the year. Passover is remembering when God in his sheer grace went over the transgressions of the people. To those who believed and who believed and trusted in the word of his messenger, God provided a covering of blood so that those who came under the covering of blood, who wiped the blood on the doorposts of their house, could be delivered from the wrath of God. The wrath of God could literally pass over them. 
So it's called the Passover. Jesus went up to Jerusalem for this special occasion. Now, even in this, this word here, we see, uh, frankly, the accuracy of Scripture, understanding the geogra- geographical makeup of Israel, because you come down from Galilee, which is where he was in Cana, down into the valley, and literally you go up to Jerusalem in the escarpment, for Jerusalem sits on the spine of a ridgeline that runs north and south. So literally, Jesus went up to Jerusalem to the Passover and enters the temple. And when he comes up those steps into the temple platform, what does he hear? Worship, prayer, the reading of the Torah. No, he comes and he hears the bleeding of sheep and the mooing of cows and he hears the bartering of trade. And so Jesus enters in dramatic fashion. It drives them all out. And when confronted with how he has the authority to do this, he makes a stunning declaration. And in that declaration, again, is the second sign that Jesus gives. Now, the wider context of what's going on in chapters 2 to chapter 4, spoken of in the words of Paul in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17, that the old has gone, the new has come. That's kind of the big idea that covers these these two chapters, three chapters, chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4. The old is gone, the new has come. So that in the Cana of Galilee, that the old wine of the law is done away with as Jesus, drawing from without, fills the purification jars up to the brim so that with the new wine of the Messianic age completely satisfies the requirements of the law. And at a wedding celebration, that Old Testament imagery rife throughout the Old Testament where God is pursuing his people and here the true bridegroom has come. The old has gone, the new has come. And now we come to the temple where the old temple is about to pass away for the new has come. In order to understand this passage rightly, we do need though to have some basic understandings of some of the main articles in this passage. Number one, frankly, the temple. I'm gonna give you a roadmap here, five major observations. And the first one is this. Let's look at the significance of the temple. Number one, the significance of the temple. This is the Passover, the temple, but the temple is kind of what takes center stage here. It's how, what Jesus addresses and then makes a direct connection to himself. So what is the significance of the temple? This is a massive, ornate structure central to the Old Testament. It's central in, in the psyche of the Jew of Jesus' day. It was emblematic of their national identity, but also of their religious identity. Now, when we think about the temple, uh, often we, we boil it down to thinking it in terms of anachronistically with maybe a church building. That this is a building and that they had a building where they worshiped Yahweh. There are massive differences between what we have here and what they had there. This is just a building. Uh, We call it the sanctuary, not because this place is intrinsically holy, but because what we do, the worship of Jesus Christ, is holy. But the church is not the building. The church is the people. This is just a structure. So maybe you think, okay, the temple is more like a a, a cathedral with sacred artifacts and specific traditions that bear some sort of intrinsic holiness. But that, again, would be a mistake. For the temple is unique. There was nothing like it in the Old Testament. There's nothing like it since in structure, physical, material structure. For the temple was the very dwelling place of the glory of God. This is where Yahweh himself made evident his glory. It was the seat of his throne on earth. It was the place of meeting with God. It was the the place of blood sacrifice and atonement. It was the center of the priesthood. It was the center of Yahweh's presence here on earth. Now, the temple itself comes from the tabernacle that we see in the Old Testament. The tabernacle that we find at the foot of Mount Sinai that God instituted there in the center of the Israelite camp, the glory of God dwelt. The tabernacle, however, was supplanted by Solomon's temple. Solomon's temple built in the 9th century century B.C., right around 1,900. We don't know the exact date, but we know that he built this magnificent temple that was ornate and glorious. And the glory of God came and dwelt there. Not because of the people's obedience. God brought Babylon. Babylon then destroyed Solomon's temple after the exiles came back, sometime after Zechariah and Malachi. 
they rebuilt a second temple, often called Zerubbabel's temple, after the man who helped steward and guide the building of the temple. So we have a second temple rebuilt. Now this is the temple that is the same temple during the time of Christ. It did not look the same because a man came along not long before the time of Christ named King Herod. King Herod wanted to curry favor from the Israelites. He wanted to become popular. So he invested a massive amount of money, resources, and energy and vastly renovated and expanded the temple platform so that by the time of Christ, it was an enormous complex. It was so magnificent in structure and size and scope that when the Romans destroyed Jerusalem in AD 70, they could not fully destroy the platform of the temple. So all they did was just kind of push the rocks off the top of it. What is the significance of the temple in terms of its function? Well, if you were to go during Jesus' day, you came up the steps into the main outer courts, the court of the Gentiles. But then you came into the inner court. The inner court had the place of altar, the sacrifice, the basin for cleansing, and then you would move into the main building. And in the main building, the holy place, you would have the, the bread table, the temple of the covenant, or the bread of the covenant, and you would also have the menorah, the, light stand, the lamp stand there. Then there would be a veil, and then you moved into the Holy of Holies, where the Ark of the Covenant was kept, although during the time of Christ, Indiana Jones had already discovered it, so it was not there. Indiana Jones is non-canonical, by the way, for those of you who do get your theology from uh, famous movies. Uh, the, 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 really, the Ark of the Covenant probably disappeared and was destroyed um, during the conquest of Babylon. Now, let's just, let's just tease this out. There's a lot of conspiracy theories out there. Even if we do find the Ark of the Covenant, all it is is a wooden box covered in gold. It bears no intrinsic value anymore. Why? Because it has been supplanted by something, dare I say, someone greater. Now, the temple itself had central function in the life of worship to the believer, to the worshiper. So that the altar, as you came into the outer court, first thing you saw was the place where the sacrifice was offered. The blood was spilt. The basin for cleansing, so that you would be holy, washed ceremonially pure. Into the main holy place, into the building itself, were for priests only. The bread of the table, the bread of the presence, symbolized the covenant with God and also the fact that through the mediation of the priests, we could commune with God. And then the lampstand that God is the light. He illuminates the darkness. And then you have the altar of incense, that communion with God through prayer. Then the Ark of the Covenant with the two cherubim over the mercy seat. And once a year, the holy priest, the high priest went in there, sprinkled the blood on the mercy seat, covering the law, covering the promises of justice by the blood so that sin could be atoned for. So that's the temple in overview. Now, at the time of Christ, again, it was magnificent, and the Holy of Holies was just empty. There was no Ark of the Covenant at that time. Josephus, one of the ancient Jewish scholars and historians, wrote this about the temple in Jesus' day. He said, The exterior of the building wanted nothing that could astound either mind or eye. For being covered on all sides with massive plates of gold, the sun was no sooner up then it radiated so fiery a flash that persons straining to look at it were compelled to avert their eyes as from the solar rays. To approaching strangers, it appeared from a distance like a snow-clad mountain. For all that was overlaid with gold was of purest white. Even the ancient rabbis wrote of the temple and they said, he who has not seen the temple of Herod has never seen a beautiful building. So Jesus comes to this location. And then he drives everybody out, Scripture says, with a whip of cords. So then the question we ask is, what is the tension? What is the problem with the temple in John 2 that would move Jesus to such a really strong, forceful action? D.A. Carson says, really, this place that was once the glorious symbol of God's dwelling with his people had degenerated into a place of commerce and perfunctory Ritual. The significance of the temple is great. Its sacredness had been misused. Let's move into point number two, the observation here, that the sacred 
has been dismissed as ordinary. The sacred has been dismissed as ordinary. And this is why Jesus acts with such force. Because it says in the text here that in the temple, in the temple courts themselves, there were traders and commercial activity, animals being bought and sold, money being exchanged within the temple courts where there should have been singing, prayer, reading of the Torah, but instead of song, noisy animals. And the temple is treated with irreverence. So the sacred is treated as profane. The temple, sacrilege has been committed against it. That which is holy has been treated as ordinary. It's important to understand that the selling of animals for sacrifice was not wrong. That was not wrong. Matter of fact, the exchanging of money to help distant travelers and pilgrims was not wrong. In the Old Testament, they did some of these things on the Mount of Olives outside of the temple precinct. Both of these services were extremely helpful because those traveling from a great distance, instead of bringing an animal with them, they could buy one and then offer that sacrifice on the temple mount. But then then there was another problem because you may be coming from Persia or Greece or Egypt and with a different currency. So you need people to exchange the money so you could pay the temple tax, but at the same time buy those things for temple sacrifices. So both services were helpful conveniences to service the worshiper coming to the temple. The problem is not the practice, but the placement of the practice. The problem is not the article itself, but where the article was being used. So that, Lenski says, that instead of solemn dignity and murmur of prayer, there is the bellowing of cattle and the bleeding of sheep. Instead of brokenness and contrition, holy adoration and prolonged petition, there is noisy commerce. So that the sacred is treated as the ordinary, and it distracts away from that which the temple was there for. I think there's a lesson here that we can learn even as a church because within the greater church, we have to ask the question, do we take things that are not wrong within themselves, things that are beneficial in their proper place, but then intrude them into Christian worship, distracting people from conviction over sin and humble contemplation of Christ? Do we veil the gospel? Now, we may debate, we, we often debate the article, whether or not it's right or wrong. And it may be that the article is neither right nor wrong. It's rather the placement of the article. Does comedy, drama, entertainment, politics, activism, with its noisy mooing and bleeding, drown out the clear proclamation of the word in the church today? Does it drown out the worshiping voices of the saints and the humble murmurings of prayer? I was reading uh, Jim Hamilton wrote an article for Nine Marks this past week, and in it he talked about the, what he considered one of the greatest threats to the evangelical church today. And the evangelical church, he said, is threatened primarily not by heresy from without or heresy from within. He said, matter of fact, most of these pastors and elders and Christian leaders would actually aspire and agree to the basic doctrines and tenets of the faith. His deep concern is that there is so much talk about other things that the gospel is virtually veiled by secondary issues. We must always, brothers and sisters, as a church, be on guard lest the accompaniments become the meal, lest good gifts and helpful gifts become idols, lest a veil be drawn over the gospel. Beauty can become a distraction. Creativity can become a veil. Academia can become a fog. Activism can become deception. And piety can become pomp. In its right place, all of these things are wonderful. And yet, I am reminded, even when my wife and I, we were in a cathedral in Oxford in the UK at Christ Church there. We were there and we were attending Vespers, just a beautiful service with all of this pomp and tradition and beauty. And as a saint who is in Christ, someone who reads the Bible, who understands the gospel. I was greatly blessed by being there. But then I was struck by the fact that if I knew nothing about the gospel, if I knew nothing about the Bible, the beauty of the cathedral, the creativity of the liturgy, the academia of the homily, the piety, 
had so veiled the gospel that if I knew nothing about Christ, I could have walked right back out of that Anglican church and I would still be as lost as when I entered with no knowledge of Christ, no knowledge of the gospel. Brothers and sisters, used rightly, these gifts can enhance our message. Used wrongly, they can supplant our message. And to our young people out there, to anyone who goes to another church, to another, but as you graduate and go forth, when you go to a church, you ask the question, what do they believe? Do they stand on the doctrines of the faith? But then you need to observe and say, do they veil the gospel with secondary issues or is Christ clearly seated at the front to be adored, exalted, lifted high and proclaimed among the nations? It's not what only we believe. It's how we talk about what we believe so that it is clear that our message rings with Acts chapter 2, verse 36. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Or Acts 4, 10 through 12. Let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, this Jesus is the stone that has been rejected by you, the builders, which have become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else. There is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. The world will look on and say, what boring oratory, what repetitive speech and speaking. We need creativity. We need the machinations of man to make this more appealing. Brothers and sisters, the reason that Christ is not appealing when the church preaches it is because they don't preach it like he is real and alive. You preach the Son of God. You live the Son of God. Then the radiance of his person and his being will march forward across the darkness, take the nations as he promised, and the fulfillment that nothing, not even hell, will stop the forward march of the church will become a reality. Why are we sleeping? Wake, my brothers and sisters, and see the living Christ. And may never the sacred become ordinary in our hearts. Third observation. Jesus is zealous for his father. Because we see that Jesus, when he sees this, his heart is tweaked. Not just tweaked. But he comes up on that platform and I wonder what he looked like. Maybe his eyes burning with fire like we see in Revelation 1. Not out of control. Not in a rage. But a righteous wrath. And then this Jesus, which, by the way, doesn't fit really well among the precious moment statues on your mantle, quietly braids a whip out of rope. And then he moves through the entire temple precinct and with a whip drives out the animals and the men selling them and overturns the money changers and drives them out. The Greek is pretty explicit here. This isn't just him driving out the animals. Jesus is taking a whip to everything and everyone that does not deserve to be there. This action by Jesus, by the way, the reason he does this is because of his zeal for his father. This is deeply personal. This is his father's house. He says that, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house trade. This is my father's house. By the way, this is his temple. Jesus loves his father. He speaks about his father in the gospel of John more than anywhere else in scripture. He loves his father so much he came to do the will of his father. The heights of salvation is to give life so that we might enjoy the very relationship that Jesus the Son enjoys with the Father. This is what Jesus came to give and to see his Father's name trampled enlivens his heart. And instead of grace, trade is being bartered. 
The temple itself is a place of grace. A place where grace is to be mediated, not a place of trade. Whereby God's provision of a sacrifice, that is not you. That through the grace and provision of that sacrifice, you could be made right with God. The whole reason for the temple is God's grace. And they have turned it into a place where salvation can be bartered, can be traded for. Makes it no different than any pagan temple. But salvation is not for us to barter. Salvation is for us to receive from the only one who can buy it, Jesus. But they've made it a house of trade, cheap goods. Why does the world not want what we, the church, have? Is it because we're bartering in cheap spiritual goods instead of the treasure that is Christ? Is it because we're offering them happiness in this life instead of trying to offer them the happiness found in Christ for all of eternity? Is it possible that it's because when we were designed for holiness, we're trying to make them happy by making them comfortable instead of helping them know how to be holy in the Holy One? You've made my father's house a house of trade. And in fulfillment of Psalm 67, he says, zeal for your house will consume me. This is my father's house. Now, people flee before Jesus' holy zeal. And, you know, they should have seen the connection in Zechariah and Malachi. He will come suddenly into his house, purge it of traitors, purify the Levitical priesthood, replace the temple, inaugurate a new era. No one will stand before him in that day. And I believe that if we could have been there that day, this is not just a man that we see. There would have been an aura of divine authority where people fled before this Jesus. Now, how will the Jews respond? Fourth observation. A sign is demanded. A sign is demanded. So we looked at the significance of the temple, number one. Number two, the sacred is treated as ordinary. Number three, Jesus is zealous for his father. Number four, a sign is demanded by the Jews. They say, give us a sign. Because what sign do you show for doing these things? In other words, what's your authority? You know, there's moments where you just wish Jesus would have said, because this is my temple, I have all the authority. They say, what authority do you have? They demand a sign. So Jesus is going to give them a sign. Here's the sign that he gives them. Destroy this temple... And in three days, I'll raise it up. Destroy this temple. And in three days, I will raise it up. Now, they were understandably befuddled, confounded. Took over four decades to build this massive structure. We know historically the Romans couldn't even destroy it. It was so magnificent and so well built. It literally is a mountaintop of stone. But what does Jesus mean? What does Jesus mean when he say, says, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up? Fifth observation. A sign is promised. So a sign is demanded, now a sign is promised. The promise is destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. But if you look at the passage, here's the epicenter of this entire passage. Verse 21. But he was speaking about the temple of his body. Jesus makes an explicit connection between the temple and his body. That the temple is a type. It's an image. It's a picture. But Jesus is the real thing. And if you destroy this temple, speaking about his body, in three days, I can raise it up again. Now, those of you who read your Bible, you understand the scriptures, What is he referring to? Three days? Destroy this body is what? The cross. Three days later? The resurrection. Here is the sign, Jesus says. 
you will destroy this body. But in three days, I will rise again. Death cannot keep me. Death cannot hold me. I will be resurrected. And then you will know that I am he. Jesus makes a direct connection between his body and the temple and the cross and the resurrection that is to come. And in so doing, explicitly states that he, Jesus, is the new temple. The temple was an image of the real thing. Now, let's play this out for just a minute. This magnificent temple, all this building, all this structure, all the priesthood. Jesus comes up there. All of this and all of its parts point to him. That's all just a type. It's all an image. That's all it is. And now the real thing is standing in their midst. The real temple, the one that all the prophets, all the sacrifices, everything has been pointing to, he's standing right there before him. Lenski beautifully writes, he says, at this time when Jesus had cleansed the temple and was confronted by the guardians of the temple, there stood side by side the beautiful type, the heavenly antitype, the earthly sanctuary, and the son of God in his human body. The promise had been replaced at last by the fulfillment. But instead of being impressed by the Savior, whom their own sanctuary had pictured to them for so long a time, they met him in the courts of that sanctuary with an incipient hostility which would grow into violent rejection. He continues. What is the use of a beautiful photograph of a father or mother when the moment that person appears before you? Why does the photograph matter when they have come before you? And yet he himself will be thrown out with abuse. That they will kill the body of Jesus. And that by killing the body of Jesus, the Jews would actually, in effect, pull down their own sanctuary. It was impossible for the sanctuary to go on pointing to the human body of the divine Savior when that Savior had, in fact, come in the flesh. So there he is standing there. What sign? He said, you will see. You will know who I am. Because he is the fulfillment of the temple. He is the fullness of the temple in all its parts. You remember that altar at the entrance of the temple? where the sacrifice and the blood is spilled to gain you access. It is Jesus who is the perfect sacrifice. It is by his blood that grants us access into the holy place of God. That basin for cleansing, that make us righteous, Jesus makes us holy, makes us righteous. And in the holy place, the, blood, the bread on the table, it is by Jesus' body and work that he seals a new covenant and that through him we can sit and dine and commune with the Father. That John 1 says that Jesus is the light of the world, that lampstand in the holy place. Jesus is that light. And at the altar of incense into the holy of holies, that place of communion and prayer, it is Romans 5, through Christ that we have access into the holy place. And then there in the holy of holies, Jesus is the mercy seat. It is his blood that is sprinkled, that covers the law. It is his blood that grants us access into the very throne room of God. And it is Jesus who is the great high priest able to affect all of it. What is the sign that all this would be accomplished? Jesus said, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. At the cross, at the resurrection, you will see that I am he. Because indeed, three days after Jesus died on the cross, he rose in power showing that he has the authority, that he is in fact the new temple. The old temple was the meeting place of God, but now through the flesh, through the body and the blood of Christ, through him, we meet with the Father. He is the fulfillment. I find it absolutely fascinating and beautiful 
that after this theological treatise in John chapter 1, that now in John 2, the first two signs that John gives us have to do with the wine and the temple. The first one, the wine. The new wine that completes and fills up the jars of the law. The wine. Remember at communion, the wine, we remember the blood. That the blood is what covers the law. It is the blood of Christ that fully satisfied the righteous requirements of the law, filled to the brim and overflowing so that nothing needs to be given. That on the cross, Jesus says, it is what? Finished. The blood and the wine. And then the second sign, the temple. The place through which God is met. Through which we are reconciled. Jesus makes it explicit that the temple is a direct line connected to his body, that Jesus is, his body is the new temple. It is through his person being united to him in his flesh and in his divinity that we participate in the blessings of him. Think back to communion. We partake in the bread, the body of Christ, the temple through which we have communion with God. The wine and the blood, the temple and the body and the bread. All this, by the way, did not make sense to the disciples until after the resurrection, after the Holy Spirit has been given, the Holy Spirit who will give them understanding and clarification. Jesus says that later in John 13 and 14. Now Jesus, in revealing himself to the world, he is looking for true worshipers. People who are not following him because of political expediency or because of chicken noodle soup for the soul today, but for those who truly believe as a savior. Now it says here in verse 23 that when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing. But Jesus on his part did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people and needed no one to bear witness about man for he himself knew what was in man. He and his omniscience can look straight into the heart. And these are people that are following him who don't really believe, who are following him for efficiency, for opportunity and expediency that he is gonna be a king who will throw off the Romans. Jesus does not entrust himself to that type of faith. But here's what the Gospel of John teaches us. That if you do believe in him truly, that you are a sinner, that he is a savior, that he alone can pay the debt of sin, that he alone can give life. If you believe in him, Jesus does entrust himself to you. Matter of fact, not only entrusts himself to you, he unites himself with you. Never to be separated again. So that in John 10, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd and no one can pluck my sheep out of my hand. And then in John 17, Jesus says to his father, Father, I can't wait. This is a paraphrase, by the way. I can't wait for them to taste my glory and to know you even as I know you. He came to fulfill. He came to give life. He came to lead us into true worship with a heart of faith. Heritage, let us worship him truly. Let us worship him wholeheartedly. Let us see he who is the new wine of God, the new temple, he who is our savior, friend, and king. Would you stand with me this morning? And let us close in prayer. Heavenly Father, I pray for my brothers and sisters here this morning that you would ignite in their hearts a fresh fire and passion for the worship and obedience of Christ. To proclaim him, to make his name known, to live for him, to enjoy him. 
to my friends who may be visiting or have been here for years but have never trusted in you, I pray that they would not barter for their salvation but cast themselves only on your grace and say that they need a savior. Heavenly Father, breathe upon us the power of your spirit, the life of Christ. May we be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, under the uttermost parts of the earth. And in Jesus' name do we pray all of these things. And all God's people said together, amen.